we're going to spend uh, good morning all of you we're going to spend next uh, 15 minutes or so talking about basic physics of echocardiography why bother to learn physics dry subject for uh, some of us at least the so i think it's about building a perfect foundation to your career as a pediatric echocardiographer you need to understand the physics behind the image or the movie on the echo machine and that will translate into a better imaging experience in all settings. You'll get more of the time you spend with the probe. You'll know when to trust your image numbers and when those numbers should not be trusted. What are the drawbacks of the echo and various components of echocardiography? This isn't really uh, not like knowing how your TV remote or your DVD works. Um, this is about echocardiography, which is your um, life basically so it's a lot different and we do need to get to the bottom of it by the end of this session we'll go through you would have gone through components that make up a good echocardiogram we'll explore sound waves at least some components that impact what we do on a daily basis directly we'll look at modes of image display including mo 2d doppler tissue doppler, strain, speckle tracking, and real-time 3D. Now, we will not be covering all of this probably today, but uh, uh, maybe, maybe we'll stop after image display. All right. This cannot be a thorough review of the physics of echo. For that, uh, my favorite text is Rebecca Snyder's Echocardiography in Pediatric Heart Disease. There are only old versions available, but they are really good. There are, of course, a whole uh, host of online resources which are very good, including uh, the website of the American Society of Echocardiography. I think the very first thing that makes up a good echocardiogram, a good result, is having a good idea of pretest probability. And what does that mean exactly? It means you know what you're looking for before you pick up your echo probe. For example, if you hear a murmur, then you know you're going in there looking for a VSD or a PDA or some valve stenosis perhaps. So let's say you've done the echo and you don't find that VSD, well, you've got to look a little harder or look at the valve a little bit more or maybe look for a coronary fistula. Had you not auscultated, if you didn't know what your pretest probability was, there's a chance you would have a false negative on your exam. Visible cyanosis, you start off with, then you know you're going in there looking for some cyanotic heart defect, which may be complex like transposition or maybe simple like pulmonary stenosis with a PFO. You're looking to do an echocardiogram on an infant with failure to thrive. You know you're going to look for a large left to right shunt that might be very visible, like a VSD, or may not be very visible, like a <laughs> which is notorious for being missed. Chest pain. You have an adolescent coming in with chest pain, which is exertional, so that should raise a red flag, and you'll be sure to look for coronary artery abnormality and not as conspicuous as uh, El Kappa perhaps, but something more subtle, maybe uh, abnormal origin or some aneurysm somewhere, abnormal um, course. But you will make sure you will have looked at all that before calling it a false negative. Starting off with syncope, well, remember, you have to make pains to ensure that you have done your best to rule out or explore the presence of pulmonary hypertension. So if there's no tricuspid regurgitant jet, you have looked at perhaps the pulse doppler of the pulmonary valve, you looked at the orientation of the interventricular septum and a lot of other things that are available these days. You're looking at a patient who's had a stroke, you know that you'll have to explore, maybe do a couple more tests to look for a PFO, look for thrombi. The second step, I believe, is preparing the baby and the infant well. So make sure that um, the baby is swaddled well, the gel is warm, but no, not too warm, of course. 
make sure that the caregiver knows what to expect, that this test will take time. It's not going to be done in five minutes, that um, this is not going to hurt. And perhaps you want the baby lying in the caregiver's um, lap. All these small things make a difference and uh, translate into a much more um, uh, relaxing atmosphere, which uh, yields good, better results. You will want to give a left lateral position for the normal situs patients to get the left lung out of the way. We know that the sound waves don't pass through air too well to get that air out, lung out. It's important to stick to your sequence of imaging. So you are dying to know what the coronary anatomy is in the TGA, but wait. Do everything first according to your protocol. Whichever you start with, make sure you start with and end with whatever you want to end with. Cover all your sequences and then give an echo diagnosis. Nobody can hurry you to do an echocardiogram unless you are in an emergency situation demanding immediate clinical attention. It makes sense to do the entire echocardiogram and then uh, look, take your eyes away from the screen and talk to people around you and inform them the diagnosis. And obviously get the best quality images possible. If it means tweaking your um, you know, things on the echo machine, a few knobs here and there, go ahead and take that extra time and do it. It'll uh, again yield better results. Archive your images for reference in the next visit. Uh, this will help um, you know, for comparison with the same patient or in a similar patient. Your report that you make, which is basically all that matters, which is what your reader sees, should reflect your imaging. It should be complete, it should be sequential, and it should be semi-quantitative. It should have some numbers. Your final impression should be tailored to the end user speciality. Your report is going to be read by a surgeon. Make sure you put the relevant details in there. Pediatrician, you may want to tweak it down to a little bit more simpler things. Neonatologist, make sure you put the PDA, PFO, PH information up there. Similarly, tailor the report for your reader if he's a neurologist or she's a hematologist. Here's the tin box that we use for our gel warming. We put in a bulb below that shelf that you see and place our, warmer, our gels on that. Much better than this, I believe, are the infant uh, bottle warmers that are available online and in supermarkets these days. Make sure uh, your gel isn't too warm. Obviously, you, you're not going to uh, wanting, be wanting to hurt the baby and uh, or the probe, which is also sensitive. Let's move on to some physics now. We look at sound waves. This is a table showing the frequency of sound, the range. For example, the first part here talks about the human having a, a hearing sound with a frequency of around 0 to 20 kilohertz, while a dog is much higher. And right here at the bottom yellow bar, dolphin can hear sound up to a frequency of 200 kilohertz. What is ultrasound? Ultrasound is something that the human cannot hear. So anything above uh, frequency above 20 kilohertz is ultrasonic sound waves. Now, how are these ultrasound waves generated and how are they helpful to us in echocardiography? Well, these are generated by the piezoelectric crystal. When an electric current is applied to a quartz crystal, it changes shape. That expansion and contraction generates sound waves. So here you see this little cartoon with the probe. It's generating sound waves, which go and uh, hit the organ. Some of the sound waves are reflected back. And those hit the crystal. The crystal then can trans transfer that or change that into electrical signals, which are processed by the um, humongous computer inside your echo machine and displayed on your screen. The piezoelectric effect was discovered in 1880 by the Curies. This is the two of them with their daughter, who also, along with the other, their parents, her parents, went on to win the Nobel Prize. Cartoon again showing how the probe emits the sound wave. 
six, um, let's say, heart wall. Some of the sound waves are transmitted to deeper structures, some are reflected, and then the probe receives those return sound waves. Now, the image that comes back can be displayed in a number of modes, the amplitude mode, a mode, brightness mode, and the motion mode. The arrangement of the probe that we see also varies. You can have a linear probe that our radiologist colleagues use, the linear curved probe, so a single row of elements that are curved to produce a desired beam shape. which you know, we use for a fetal echo, we have this curvy linear one. And then there's a 2D matrix or a 3D matrix probe these days, where the elements are arranged in a grid pattern. So we use a 2D and a 3D matrix probe. The most important attribute of this probe is the frequency, which is you know, printed here on the side of the probe. The frequency determines the wavelength, and why is that important? Because the wavelength determines the limit of resolution. Remember that structures have to be separated by a distance of at least one wavelength in order to be resolved. Here's a um, sound wave. This is its wavelength, and these are two structures. If the structures aren't separated by this wavelength, then they're not going to be seen as two, they'll be seen as one. Now, this is something that will be picked up and seen as two separate objects, this won't be. So what exactly is the relationship between frequency and wavelength? Let's go back to seventh standard or sixth standard physics. Velocity is equal to distance upon time. And in parlance of sound waves, we can have velocity C, velocity of sound measured in meters per second equals to distance, which is wavelength measured in meters. And upon time, instead of putting that down in the denominator, we get it up one upon time. One upon second is nothing but frequency. So that unit is hertz or one upon second. So that's F. So C is equal to F lambda. C is constant in human tissue. The sound of um, the velocity of sound waves in the human tissue, soft tissue, is around 15, 16 meters per second. The frequency that we use in medical applications is 2 to 12 megahertz. So, if you rearrange the equation, get the lambda on the left side, you get lambda equals C by F, and uh, C is fixed while F varies from 2 to 12 megahertz, your lambda will vary from 0 0.8 to 0 0.13 millimeters. That's your wavelength. So structures have to be separated by at least 0.1 mm, one tenth of a millimeter to be seen as two structures and to be picked up by the um, probe. This is the fundamental limit of resolution possible with a given transducer frequency. Let's look at the neonatal probe, 12 megahertz, correct? So you put in the numbers over there, C is equal to F lambda equation. Lambda is C by F, lambda is 1560 divided by frequency 12 megahertz is 12 followed by six zeros, gives you so much this of a number or 0.13 mm. While the adult probe, you put in the numbers instead of uh, F of 12 megahertz, put in 2, and you get 0.78. So a neonated probe, the lambda was 0.1. Adult probe is 0.7. A neonated probe will have a better resolution than an adult probe. This is where that the whole basis for that thing is. Couple more slides on resolution. Resolution can be axial or lateral. So axial resolution is resolution along the axis of the ultrasound beam. So at a different depth, you're seeing something on the same um, same axis. While lateral re resolution is resolution in the direction that is perpendicular to the beam's axis. The third, uh, the second kind of resolution is the temporal resolution. Now to optimize your axial or lateral resolution, you need to use the highest frequency transducer. 
you need to optimize the focal zone keep it at the depth that of the structure you want to study use minimum necessary gain that means decrease the whiteness of the picture so moving on to temporal resolution this is dependent on the frame rate it's improved by minimizing the depth narrowing the sector to the area of interest that is narrowing the sector angle and minimizing line density this is the tabulation of the different kinds of probes that we have at our disposal the 12 8 and the 3 or you know 3 to 5 megahertz probe that we use for dart look at the first row resolution that's maximum with the new navel and least with the adult probe the depth penetration is maximum with the adult while depth suffers with the 12 megahertz probe color doppler is best with the adult probe the footprint which means the size of the probe um, that that the, that hits the skin is small with the 12 megahertz and uh, large with the adult probe So let's say you're looking at an infant with the transposition of the right artery, and uh, he is what, let's say, five kg, and you want to look at the coronary anatomy. Which probe will you use? Would you use the S8 probe, S12, S4? Would be probably in a five kg infant working with the S8 probe. So would you like to continue using that, or uh, do you have an option of something better? Is anybody there willing to? Tell me, share that with me. So you will get the better coronary anatomy with the S12 probe. Remember, the coronaries, especially the um, origin, are superficial. So in a 5 kg infant, you can switch to an S12 probe, and you will certainly get better pictures when you aim from your parasternal view. Let's say you have an ALC patient, uh, and this is in an 11-year-old plumpish boy. You're doing your subcostal imaging. You're not happy with the S8 probe, not getting better pictures. So, which probe would you then pick up to help you out? Would you go for the S4 or the S12 probe? So, what is happening in this plump 11-year-old is that your S8 is giving you problem with penetration. You would be better off picking up your adult probe, your S4 probe, and trying it with that, and likely that you'll get better pictures. So, what is the relationship between frequency and wavelength? Is it that the higher the frequency, the higher the wavelength? Is it that the higher the frequency, the lower the wavelength? Anybody wants to answer that? so we just went through this concept we looked at the high frequency probe and we found that the wavelength was less the 12 probe had the lowest wavelength and hence the highest relation, um, uh, highest resolution so the correct answer is the higher the frequency the lower the wavelength and better the resolution have you wondered why sonogram of the heart is called echocardiography Well, everything started with Messrs. Hertz and Edler in 1961. They were using a reflectoscope and ultrasonoscope. Then Harvey Feigenbaum in the United States uh, took things a little bit more ahead in 1965. Published a paper on looking at pericardial effusion with this technique. He called it ultrasound cardiography. By that time, they were using This technique to look at the brain and calling it echoencephalography. So then Keegan Baum said, "Why not call this echocardiography?" So that's how the name came about. This is one of the earlier echocardiography machines. Here you have Keegan Baum doing an echocardiogram, probably in the um, 16s. That's the probe right there. That's the cable. You know, we have such a big fat cable carrying so many more complicated um, wires inside. 
and here's the machine and somewhere there is a tiny screen where you actually see what what's happening inside the heart this is all part of the echocardiography machine that's the recording apparatus let's move on to our next session which looks at mode of uh, modes of image display whether it's m mode or 2d or doppler So the various modes are M, which is the earliest version, the two-dimensional, the spectral Doppler, which are of two types, the pulse wave and the continuous wave, and there is color Doppler. There is also Dopplering a different substance, which is tissue Doppler, rather than the blood, which is the regular Doppler that we do on a daily basis. To complete the list, you of course have speckle tracking and real-time three-dimensional echocardiography. M mode stands for motion mode. It's the graphic display of motion of cardiac structures in real time. The ultrasound pulses are repeated more than thousand times per second. So in this <clears throat> cartoon, on the y-axis you have distance from the transducer so here's your probe that's the chest wall you've got these sound waves hitting uh, going through the various heart structures so here's one sound wave then a milli millisecond later you have another sound wave going through the same bit of the heart but just a little bit later and on the x-axis you have the time so what it's telling you is what happens when you keep on interrogating the same slice of the heart over time. And you display it in this format. Because the sampling rate around 1000 for every second is much more than the heart rate or what happens in the heart with every heartbeat, there are many, many samples of cardiac structures in real time. That's one aspect of it. The second aspect of it is the gray scale. How intense the returning echo is determines the shade of gray of the corresponding dot. Look at this. You've got your cursor here across the right ventricle and then across the uh, septum and the LV cavity posterior wall. You've got this cursor cutting across it. And this is how things look out, look over time. So you've got this over here going at 100 millimeters per second. And you've got the various structures plotted out. You've got a slightly more echogenic posterior wall. You've got the blood showing up as um, black. So the grayness corresponds to the intensity of reflected sound waves. We use M mode these days to obtain dimensions of the chamber walls and cavities. In the current recommendation of the ASE and the European Society, um, they say that because your 2D imaging is so good, you can get your dimensions of LV, RV, et cetera from the 2D and no need to go for M mode. Uh, but in our pediatric world, because our uh, patient's heart rates are a lot faster generally, double that of the adult, it, it still makes sense uh, to use the M mode for this purpose because you get a much better um, temporal resolution um, with, with M mode. You can also use M mode for LV mass and LV volume measurement to quantify ventricular function is what we still do, a very basic method though, but something that is most commonly used, the ejection fraction and shortening fraction. So you have it all, uh, you know, printed out because we've got all the formulae fed in. The shortening fraction is 26.7 here. The EF is 53.9%. You even get the mass by the formula. But remember, it's just interrogating this ISPIC, ISPIC view of the heart. So it has its uh, limitations. Look at this over here. We're looking at the ventricular septum. In this particular um, image, we see how the septum is excreting diastole, systole, diastole is the time frame, the time point when there's maximum separation of the septum from the posterior wall. Systole is when they come together. 
So how it's moving while over here the septal movement is flat. This is very well appreciated on M mode. Um, as is mitral valve motion, for example, in hypertrophic or obstructive cardiomyopathy, you've got anterior motion of the mitral leaflet and fistulae. So that too can be very well captured on M mode because M mode has very good temporal resolution. This is Dr. Feigenbaum. He's had an article in 2010. Uh, just when everybody was thinking M mode tells us nothing, he came out with a nice paper telling us all the advantages of M mode in the current world. So, can somebody tell me how heart rhythm is determined on fetal echocardiography? So, on fetal echo, you obviously cannot get the rhythm by putting in an ECG on the maternal abdomen that doesn't work. So many reasons for it. Most basic being that there's too much, too many substances between the maternal abdomen and the fetal heart. So it really just doesn't pick up apart from the mother's heartbeat and differing, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So we determine the heart rhythm by M mode. Here's the fetal heart sitting inside the thorax. The lungs, of course, are all liquid filled. So very nicely, um, they allow us to see the heart. And you've got, we can get a cursor, pass through the fetal heart like this, cutting across the right atrium and the left ventricle. And you look at these tiny movements there. Because the temporal resolution of M mode is very high, what is happening every second is captured so beautifully. And this, this, this bit reflects the right atrial wall movement, while at the bottom, furthest away from where your, your apex of the sector is, is your left ventricular wall. So you can see over here in this particular case, there are lots more atrial movements compared to ventricular movements, so you know that there is an arrhythmia. This is one way of determining the rhythm in a fetal echo. Let's move on to two-dimensional echocardiography now. 2D is a cross-sectional echocardiography versus the ice pick version of M mode. Imagine that your probe is on, let's say, the abdomen, and it's passing through these structures, producing corresponding dots, and then you move the probe a little bit, in the center and you get different kind of dots depending on the depth and the intensity of the returning sound wave. You move it some more and suppose you move it all round, you would get this kind of picture. And suppose you could do it instantly, well that's 2D echocardiography for you. You don't end up, you don't end up moving your probe all over the abdomen. Instead, the fantastic uh, machinery inside has a beam that does all that for you instantly. A typical display uses more than 128 lines of information to produce one frame. So why do I have put this up? This is uh, the Bollywood world in the 1970s. Lots of Amitabh Bachchan and Rajesh Khanna, Devanand movies there. Uh, right at that time was when lots of advances were being made in echocardiography. Let's talk a little bit about Inge Edler. Um, him and Dr. Hertz got a chance to work together. This was in Scandinavia and this was in the early 1950s. They got help from Siemens company who let them borrow their ultrasound reflectoscope. And they used that, recorded the first moving picture of the heart, 29th October, 1953. So, Dr. Inge Edler can be called the father of echocardiography. He published his work, but it wasn't really appreciated too much at that time by radiologists or other cardiologists. And he himself got uh, frustrated. This is what I read. And it was only much later than in the 1970s that other people took interest, especially Dr. Feigenbaum. And there were more publications. And suddenly, after that, in the 70s, lots and lots of uh, improvements. 
So the very same award given to Blalock and Tossett and Conan, finally, and Lily High, of course, the surgeon, uh, finally came to uh, these, these two people, but uh, after retirement, 1977. Here's a picture of an earlier echocardiography machine. You have the doctor or the echo technician, and there's your patient. That's the screen, and here's all the machinery required to generate that. A color picture of a more recent model. And you can contrast this with what we have these days, right down to the handheld echo devices. Going back to a discussion on the physics of 2D echo, the image quality is dependent on the pathway of the sound waves that we have. So if it's a lungy patient, a lot of air in there, then you will not have good pictures. If your heart is behind the sternum, obviously that will be bad. So frequency of the probe, we'll look into that a little bit now. In the last, um, last bullet here is object depth that also impacts the image quality. So here's looking at a parasternal long axis view with an S5 probe. This is in a smaller child, okay, an infant. And you can see, of course, you can see the heart beating properly and you can make out all the gross structures, the aortic valve, see how it looks, mitral valve, you're not sure, abnormal, not normal. Um, look at uh, the frame rate here, 77 hertz. Now look at the same picture. Not moving. This is with a 3 8 probe. Now, here we've got this actually in fiscally. Um, well, the point was to show you that what looked like perhaps this plastic aortic valve is really not so. And similarly, the mitral valve apparatus also showed up with much better resolution and didn't look uh, pathologic. Look at this. And this is with an S12 probe, the very same patient. And you see how nicely the mitral valve leaflets have, have resolved. The aortic valve too, I'm sorry, the video is not playing, but uh, this also showed up very nicely, telling you that you've got to use the right probe for the right patient, otherwise you can interpret things wrongly. Your frame rate here also varies. It becomes higher with the you know higher frequency probe, and that affects your temporal resolution. Look at this picture um, in parasternal long axis view where you've got the depth set at 12 centimeters, a lot of wasted echo space behind the heart. If you set it at six centimeters, you you know you've got it much better. You you've got your focus here, right here on the RV and the interventricular septum. So this is how things should be optimized. Now look what happens over here. You've got a parasternal um, long axis view, the RV OT view. You've got your pulmonary valve. So you've got a frame rate of 95. If you narrow the the sector size, your frame rate doubles, 198 hertz. Now what that means is it's going to give you much better images of the pulmonary valve opening and closing, giving you a better idea of what kind of pathology you're dealing with in case of a pulmonary valve stenosis, et cetera. So next time you want to image structures, especially valves moving very fast, obviously, go ahead and narrow the sector size. You'll get much better resolution, guaranteed. Let's move on to spectral Doppler, which is of two types, pulse wave or continuous wave. But before we do that, a quiz question for you, which modality has a higher frame rate? And I've been going on and on about it in the past 10 minutes. Would it be 2D or would it be M mode? The correct answer is M mode. M mode has a much higher frame rate. So Doppler echocardiography is all thanks to Christian Doppler and diaphysicist family actually. 
through Doppler ultrasound, we get information about blood velocity. The Doppler mode examines the direction and speed of blood flow, that's the velocity, and presents it in three formats. You have what you can hear, you have what you can see as color, and you have what is seen uh, plotted on a, um, in a graphical form. The principle of Doppler shift is that there's a change in frequency from the French to the returning sound wave. Change means it either increases or de decreases. So you, let's say you are Dopplering uh, a blood vessel and you've got the RVC traveling towards the probe. Then the frequency goes up. And if your RVCs are traveling away from the probe, the frequency goes uh, the frequency goes down. So this shift is displayed in audible format because the magnitude of the shift, the magnitude of the change between what is transmitted and what is received back is in the is in the order of several kilohertz, and it's not. Uh, very high and our um, human range of hearing from 0 to 20 kilo to, uh, 20 kilohertz is uh, it, it's within that so therefore audible to us so all that whoosh sound that you hear is just the sound of the frequency shift let's move in a little bit deeper into the doppler equation it's a formidable looking equation, but not really. If you spend some time with it, here you we are showing you the probe. You've got the sound waves hitting the blood, the RBC. You've got an angle being made with the Doppler beam versus the direction of the RBC. Now next, let's look at this equation once more. On the left side, you have FB, which is the frequency of returning sound waves. And on the right side, you have these, out of which the easiest to understand is C. <coughs> this is the velocity of sound wave, which is in um, human diffuse 1560 meters per second. This angle theta is the intercept angle that we saw in the last picture between your Doppler and your blood flow. The V is the velocity of blood flow, which is what you're trying to determine. For example, you have pulmonary valve stenosis. You're trying to determine the velocity of the um, blood going through it because you know when there's a narrowing, the velocity is going to speed up. So that's your unknown variable. C, you know. Cos theta, you know. Then FO stands for the original frequency, which is what your probe is transmitting. So 12 megahertz. So transmitting a frequency of 12 megahertz. And this is the frequency of returning sound waves. Now if we rearrange things and put the V on the, the unknown uh, quantity on the left side, then uh, C and these are constant, the, the, what, the transmitting frequency, angle theta is when the intercept angle is 0 or 180, the value of cos theta is 1, which means that when your Doppler is totally cursor, is totally aligned with the direction of blood flow, then you'll have the least error. Small changes in angle can cause large differences in estimated velocities. Look at this cartoon. You are supposed to interrogating the aortic valve from the supersternal notch. You've got your um, RBCs going through like this. <coughs> Your intercept angle is 10 degrees, you've got a velocity of 1.97 meters per second that you pick up. But suppose your intercept angle is you know very awkward at 60 degrees, and you will not pick up the maximum velocity and you'll get false readings. So we we saw how we had an audible output from Doppler. The second thing we have is also a spectral Doppler, the graphical form. So here you have your uh, Doppler inter interrogation of the aorta. Your probe is in the suprasternal notch. You've got RBCs traveling towards your probe. So in the graphical uh, representation, your baseline is here, and you've got any flow 
moving towards the probe recorded as a positive wave. While in the descending aorta, the same probe encounters RBCs moving away and you've got display below the baseline for that. Pulse wave and continuous wave Doppler uh, are uh, the, the two ways we can have, uh, you know, Doppler measured or taken. Pulse wave is when you you are sampling only a particular spot. You want to know the velocity at that particular point, or understand uh, the waveforms at a particular point. So when we switch to pulse wave Doppler, we have a single ultrasound crystal transmitting short bursts of sound waves to the selected depth only. It sends out short bursts, it waits for them to come back and then sends out again. The rate that it does this must be such that the sound wave can travel down to the selected depth and back before the next wave can enter the heart. This is a must in order to pulse, get pulse wave Doppler readings. So here's your probe sending out these uh, bursts of sound waves at, you know, which, which are separated from each other. And in this time is when it will rec be receiving those sound waves that are transmitted back. So you've got your probe and this is your sample volume. You've got the pulse wave at the mitral valve leaflet tip. And you've got this graphical display, pulse wave Doppler. So we use pulse wave Doppler when we want to study the diastolic function of the heart by interrogating the mitral valve, look at the E and the A wave. If you use a continuous wave, which is the other kind of Doppler, then you will not be just interrogating the tips of the mitral leaflets, but pretty much everything that the cursor encounters. So the whole whole um, uh, basis of the diastolic function of the heart as interpreted by the mitral valve or Doppler is on what happens at the tip of the mitral leaflet. So you definitely want to pulse wave Doppler there. Continuous wave will not do. You can certainly use continuous wave when you're looking at mitral stenosis when you want the maximum possible velocity, the maximum possible stenosis, but not for diastolic function of the heart, where everything is standardized to obtaining a pulse Doppler at the tip of the mitral leaflet. Another application of pulse wave Doppler is when you have, let's say, a total anomalous pulmonary venous connection, and there's some obstruction you want to interrogate that particular point to go ahead and pulse wave Doppler it and get your numbers out there. We talked about how short bursts of sound waves are sent, then there's a pause and then they come back. So that pulse repetition frequency will be higher, uh, you know, it makes sense, will be higher at a lesser depth of the sample volume. At shallow depths, the pulse repetition frequency and therefore the maximum detectable frequency is higher. This maximum detectable frequency is called the Nyquist limit. Why is it important? We'll get to that in a second. The Nyquist limit and the blood flow velocity are related by the Doppler equation. So here, here's what it is. If the velocity of blood at the sampling site that you know that you want to interrogate, that you're interested in knowing what the velocity of blood is. If it's more than that can be picked up by the transducer, then you'll have a problem in your graphical output. So here's an example of how it'll look when there's a problem. It's called aliasing. You are looking at something above the baseline. You know you've got your RBC stabbing towards you. You've got your sample gate set up somewhere for the pulse wave Doppler, and this is the kind of signal that you get. That means whatever sample site that you have, the velocity of blood over there is not suitable for the current pulse wave Doppler settings. You've got to change things in order to get your entire picture on one side of the baseline. So that depends on the frequency of the transducer used. We're not talking about cost theta here. See, we're not talking about the velocity of the sound waves. We're talking about the transmitted frequency, the FD, 
and V is the velocity what we are trying to pick up. The higher the transmitted frequency, I'm sorry, the transmitted frequency is F O, excuse me. So that is in the denominator. The higher the transmitted frequency, because it's an inverse relationship over here, the lower the velocity that can be picked up. So a higher frequency probe, for example, the, the 12 probe, means you will not get a good pulse wave doppler. You may encounter al aliasing much more frequently with the 12 megahertz probe. Compare that with a 6 megahertz probe, you'll get much better um, PRF and much better pulse wave doppler uh, velocities that can be displayed. So how do we go about increasing the Nyquist limit? Well, you can shift the baseline to one end. So more of the display can be used to examine the flow in one of the directions only. You can decrease the depth and uh, basically or try and try shifting to a, a lower frequency probe. Continuous wave Doppler. Now this is when Doppler signals from all the blood flow along the cursor are received and displayed. Since there's a continuous sampling and receiving, even a higher frequency Doppler shift can be detected. So all of those limitations of pulse wave Doppler just don't exist. There's no limit to the ability of the maximum velocity that can be measured. Continuously, there are uh, sound waves being transmitted and received. So here you are measuring the peak velocity across the aortic valve. You've got a cursor there and it's blue flow because your cursor, uh, your apex of the sector is at over here at the apex of the heart. And blue flow means below the baseline is where you get your uh, spectral Doppler recording. You can go ahead and obtain a peak velocity. Now, how do we link the velocity measured by Doppler to the pressure gradient? We can enter uh, that bit by exploring the Bernoulli's equation. I think I'd like to end the talk over here and continue next time. I think the next session will be on the 9th, so we can revise what we did so far and continue from, from the Bernoulli's equation the next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>